to today's live panel discussion hosted by SIX, focusing today on the Greenfield properties our speakers work with. I'm joined today by Rick Van Nieuwenhuizen, Contango Ores President and CEO, Brandon McDonald, CEO and Director of Fireweed Zinc, Mark Jarvis, CEO of Giga Metals, and Tim Livesey, CEO of Oriel Resources. Today's panelists are going to be having a discussion about the unique, untouched, and unexplored Greenfield properties that they work with. And after we'll move on to a live Q&A session, we'll be accepting and answering some questions. You can submit your questions using the Q&A panel found on the right-hand side of your screen at any time during today's panel. And as always, this video is being recorded. It will be available to watch afterwards on Six.com in the coming days. Uh, but to begin with, I'd like to offer a few minutes to each panelist to introduce themselves and their company before we begin in earnest. So with that, Rick, I'd like to begin with you and Contango Or. Go ahead. Well, good morning, and thanks, uh, Cam. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us this morning. Um, Contango is working on a number of projects in Alaska uh, from advanced stage to uh, grassroots. And so I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, all of those. Uh, I wanted to just mention we are a bit of a unique company that we don't have a lot of shares outstanding. We're New York uh, Stock Exchange American Traded, uh, symbol CTGO. We only have 6.7 million shares and we have $25 million in cash. So we're well funded for what we're, uh, we're about to undertake here. Our, our main project, Mancho, is in uh, Alaska. It's, uh, it was discovered as a grassroots discovery. Uh, we've outlined 1.3 million ounces at four grams open pit right next to the highway on private land owned by the Tetlin tribe. Kinross, we entered into a business combination with uh, Kinross. They paid $93 million for their 70% interest, so they're, they're all in, if you will. Uh, the whole reason we did that is to be able to transport the, the uh, Mancho ore up to the Fort Knox mill, which is uh, shown here in red. Uh, the Mancho deposit in yellow. So this is uh, this is the Mancho area. Uh, there's two deposits. It was found with stream sediment geochemistry. Nobody had ever done any work in this area. It was on private land owned by the tribe, and the tribe had never invited anybody in to do any work. Um, our plan is to get this into production uh, quickly because we don't have to build a mill and a tailings facility. Uh, we'll start construction next year and finish it up and be in production, full production by 2024. Kinross guidance uh, is that we'll, the, the, the joint venture will produce 220,000 ounces uh, on average a year. Our 30% would be roughly 66,000. Uh, they've given us guidance of $130 million uh, for, on the high end for capital. Our share would be about 40 million and uh, our all in sustaining cost about 750, which uh, today's gold price gives us uh, just over a thousand dollar margin. So we're generating 60 to 70 million dollars of free cash flow a year. Um, a pretty uh, pretty nice place to be for a junior exploration company. Um, lots of exploration upside here. Uh, this is the, these are the two main deposits that you saw in the photo. Lots of geochem uh, at surface that indicates that there's big anomalies here that are still untested. And this only represents, this map represents about 2% of our 688,000 acres of, uh, of exploration land. So you can see we'll be plenty busy over the next year here. So while Ken Ross is advancing the project to a production decision, uh, we'll be working on our other early stage exploration projects. Our Mancho project is here. This is the joint venture in yellow. Uh, next to that is the Eagle Hona project, uh, a large area of uh, stratigraphy that's continuous with the, uh, the Mancho. Uh, area. Our triple Z project where uh, early stage exploration is outlined a porphyry target. Uh, our shamrock project up here uh, in the Pogo district uh, right next to the highway produced 120,000 ounces of uh, alluvial gold and we're looking basically for the source of that gold. And then finally our lucky shot project which is uh, just located just outside of Anchorage. Lucky Shot's an interesting one. Uh, it produced historically a, a quarter million ounces at one and a half grams per, or one and a half ounces per ton. So about 40 grams per ton. High grade, narrow vein structures. Uh, they mined uh, free gold in quartz here. Uh, very simple gravity uh, recovery of the gold. Um, and there were 30 operating mines in this district uh, We've now consolidated a good part of those. There's a number of patented claims that we're still working on consolidating. Uh, and we see this as both an advanced stage project. We'll have, we have a plan here to advance uh, the Lucky Shot mine itself, but we're going we're to also be looking at uh, the other 30 historic mines in the district, which all were in the granite diorite, which is uh, the lighter colored rock here. We see all the, all the X's and Y's. What's never really been looked at is the schist, the purple rocks down 
uh, down below there. And uh, that's something we'll, uh, they didn't mind those because they were too low grade. Uh, they like these high grade, narrow, high grade veins that were running one, one to two ounces. So again, a uh, bit of a combination of, of uh, early stage and advanced stage projects. Um, so while uh, we're generating cash flow from our operation in two years at Mancho, uh, 60, $70 million of free cash flow, we can then use that money to advance our other projects, find more gold uh, without dilution to our, to our shareholder base. And uh, I'll, I'll stop there and turn it back over to you, Cam. Great, thanks a lot, Rick. Uh, with that, I think we'll pass it over to Brandon from Fireweed Zinc to lead us on their presentation. Thank you very much. Um, glad to be here. Uh, look, I think everyone's kind of uh, familiar with the the crisis we've entered with COVID and and the optimism that comes out of it. And and part of what you know Fireweed sees is that. Um, Already, you know, base metals have, have had a tremendous move uh, in the last couple of years, and, and we see a, it's just really the beginning of a nascent, uh, long-lived bull market for base metals and, and zinc specifically. Uh, you know, we're, we're thinking around infrastructure stimulus and, and what that's going to do to demand. So, you know, when you think about increased zinc demand, there's not a lot of projects like McMillan Pass, our flagship project located in Yukon Territory. Uh, you know, it's it's big, it's it's a standout in terms of scale, but but also in terms of exploration upside. Um, you know, we've attracted investment from from tech and, and had a lot of uh, big companies with eyeballs on us. Um, it is green fields, though, and, and um, you know, we've we've made some uh, great exploration successes there, including the discovery of uh, of uh, Boundary West last year and, and the expansion of that with some new high grade zones this year. Um, and uh, despite all its potential, like a lot of companies, we're, we're still uh, dirt cheap. Um, you know, one of the things about Greenfields, and I don't want to belabor economics of the project because the project looks a lot different now than than it uh, did in 2018. Um, but when you're when you're Greenfields and you're remote, um, you know you have there's not a lot of benchmarks for for a project. So we considered it important to do early stage economics on it. Um, you know, a, a PEA shortly after we bought the project, um, and we kind of hit the marks. We we wanted to see you know clear uh, you know multi-cycle mine life, um, you know, healthy NPV and IRR. Um, and the project's got so much better than there, you know, since 2018, in no small part because of exploration success. And, and when we did that PEA, when we did that resource statement um, in 2018, we, we were really looking only at the Tom and Jason deposits, uh, which, you know, is in the, the southwest or southeast, sorry, of our project. Um, you know, at the time, we, we bought the core of the project of HUD Bay and it had been idle for for 20 plus years and um you know we had 54 square kilometers and we've expanded that to 940 square kilometers and, and we see a, a real um thesis for this being a district you know we see a repeatable uh thesis for for exploring and, and discovering uh, additional setx and, and setx uh proximal i guess styles of deposits um you know the, the success particularly at boundary and boundary west in the last three years has really demonstrated uh, the scale potential of this project. And you know, what we see at Boundary West is, is not um, um, CEDEX, you know, the, first off, CEDEX is kind of a, a deprecated term, uh, you know, shale hosted uh, base metal deposit um, uh, better, because uh, we no longer think that it's uh, exhalative, um, but, um, Nonetheless, what we saw boundary initially was nothing like that. You know, this was this was sphalerite veining, uh, breccias, uh, you know, class replacement, et cetera, and not like the classic um, finely banded um, shale barite hosted stuff that we saw at Tom and Jason. Uh, so it got us thinking and and um, made us think that, that perhaps what we were seeing at boundary was a feeder to some type of of uh, stratiform system. And that's what we found at Boundary West. Uh, uh, 2020, um, and then expanded in, in 2021. So this was a brand new discovery at, at Boundary West in, in 2021, and we've been iteratively uh, expanding that in the last couple of years. And we see various different styles of mineralization there. We do see the the vein style of mineralization um, that exists at, at Boundary nearby, but you know we see Tom and Jason style stratiform stuff, which was a great success to see that, and you know very high grade, you know 10 and a half meters of 
almost 24% zinc, 3.5% lead, and, and uh, 75 grams silver. So, um, you know, that was a major success, uh, the discovery of, of Boundary West there. Um, but, you know, beyond that, we, we continue to explore and, and, you know, using new techniques, you know, we use uh, gravity extensively. We're, we're deploying a new style of, of geophysics called muon tomography with our partners, Ideon, um, which is kind of a, a, a uh, subsurface X-ray. Um, to look for these dense bodies, which which contrast nicely against the the, uh, the um, country rocks, um, so you know we're we're looking forward to more success there, and we really see that you know, the 2018 PEA was a base case. Um, we've had government commitment to funding uh, our roads since then. We've had massive exploration success at Boundary Zone. Uh, we've got all sorts of brand new targets to explore. So we really see that as the core of a, a much much. Uh, more uh, large and robust project uh, going forward. So that's it. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Brandon. And with that, we'll hand it over to Mark Jarvis of Giga Metals. Okay. Well, uh, thanks very much. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm glad everyone's here. Uh, so we are a company. Um, our core project is in uh, North Central British Columbia. Um, the Turnigan project, it's a, it's a very large, uh, low-grade, open-pitable nickel and cobalt and sulfides deposit. Um, we did a PEA recently modeling production of uh, nameplate capacity of 37,000 tons per year of nickel um, with a 37-year mine life. So, you know, truly a giant deposit. Um, and we're uh, going through a development process with that. Um, but what I'm here to talk about today is uh, we've got a greenfields exploration project in Brazil that's uh, quite interesting. Um, and, and it all started with this thought that, um, you know, South America and Africa used to be the same continent. And uh, the San Francisco uh, Craton uh, in Brazil uh, is thought to be an offshoot of the copper belt in West Africa. And so we started with that concept um, and did tons of uh, research uh, in this area of, uh, of Brazil. Uh, some areas of interest were already fully staked, but we found a couple of areas, and one in particular, that uh, had quite a bit of open ground. And so what we're chasing here is uh, red bed, uh, copper mineralization. It can be copper cobalt, it can be copper silver, uh, and we're early stage. Uh, so this is where we are. And and it was interesting as, as we had geologists in there doing uh, uh, stream sediment sampling, uh, you know, some geochem. We also came across uh, water wells that had been drilled by the locals. And these water wells uh, had, you know, piles of blue chips beside them. And so our geologists picked them up and, you know, sure enough, they contain meaningful amounts of copper. So uh, we're looking for these pre-Cambrian to Cambrian um, uh, in age uh, red bed, you know, copper uh, type deposits. Um, our exploration is being managed from here by uh, Dave Tupper, who's an old friend of mine. He's a very experienced uh, exploration geologist. And we're working with someone named John Hill, who is actually living in Brazil. He's married to a Brazilian woman. And, you know, it's very important. He's uh, ex-Anglo. It's very important that you understand in a challenging uh, a jurisdiction like Brazil, that you understand how things work locally. Um, it's less challenging, however, than the Congo. So um, that's why we're pressing ahead with this. We are currently uh, drilling with a percussion drill we're doing a series of uh, 10 holes to about 150 meters just to um, you know prove the concept that we do have these uh, these sedimentary horizons uh, under shallow ground cover um, and uh, so far you know we are seeing uh, you know we're seeing sandstone uh, we're seeing a bit of blue in the sandstone don't really know what's going on yet we're going to complete the program it's actually been uh, uh, halted for a couple of weeks over Christmas. There was some flooding down there, so we're planning to restart the program in uh, in the new year. Um, it's just you know it's just very interesting, and um, you know 
whenever you're turning a drill, you know, lightning could strike. And that's sort of one of the things that I enjoy about this. Um, uh, and that's, uh, that's all I'll say. We can move on. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mark. And with that, we'll move on to Tim Livesey from Oriole. Thanks very much, Cap. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're going to leap across to Africa now from, uh, from the Americas. Uh, although we are effectively a continuation of, uh, of the last project across on, on, the, um, on the Cameroon side of, of the Atlantic. Uh, you'll, you'll recognize if you relocate um, <clears throat> Africa and Brazil, uh, we're actually in that in Cameroon. We're operating in a mobile belt zone between the Congo Craton and the West African Craton, which is where we have a um, significant land holdings and uh, an area that we consider to be a, a grassroots uh, greenfield discovery, and also an area for a potential new gold mining district. Uh, we also have <clears throat> a project up in Senegal, which I'll come to at the end of the of the presentation. Uh, Senegal is currently under an earn-in agreement by IM Gold. Uh, they're in the fourth year of an initial four-year program uh, with an option to gain up to 51%. And then um, <clears throat> there's a renewal date early next year for them to option up to 70% if they, if they so wish. So we'll, <clears throat> we'll move into Cameroon. Cameroon's quite, a, quite an interesting jurisdiction. Um, we have two licenses in the north of Cameroon, Bibimi and Wakuzi. And these were originally an exploration success, uh, a new discovery um, <clears throat> in a previously unexplored uh, area for my a company I was previously COO for, Reservoir Minerals. Um, there was a discovery here in 2012, uh, gold in <clears throat> nugget form and um, in in uh, rock chip sample form on surface on both the Bibami and Wapuzi licenses. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, the, the projects didn't get a great deal of attention after that discovery because for Reservoir, at the same time, we discovered uh, the Chikarapeki uh, copper gold project in Serbia, just, just next to the Bohr Maidenpec uh, mining complex, and that took our main focus. So these two licenses, to some extent, were kind of orphaned, <clears throat> and um, when I came into Oriel Resources a few years ago, we restarted that relationship with the local partner, got in on the ground, and what we've been able to do this year is put 28 holes into the Bibimi targets. We've got over eight kilometers of um, surface anomalism, which has been identified and followed up with trenching and sampling at Bibimi. And um, <clears throat> we've extended Orogenic gold mineralization down to depth of 100 meters uh, in all the holes we drilled or in over half of the holes we drilled to date. Um, at Wapuzi, just to the north of here, we're a little bit behind that uh, that uh, with targeting and we're, we're working up some drill targets right now. So uh, both those real classic Greenfields discoveries. Um, <clears throat> but in Cameroon, the really exciting thing for us is what we call the CLP or the Central License Package. And this is uh, three and a half thousand square kilometers uh, divided into eight licenses in the middle of Cameroon. It's associated with the Choliro Banyo shear zone, which is a splay off the central Cameroon shear zone, which if you relocate runs across into Brazil. And um, you can see from this image, we've, we've done some early work in here. We've done some stream sediment sampling and we've identified um, good mineralization along uh, or good anomalism, should I say, along the um, 35 to 40 kilometers of Chile Robano shear zone in the three licenses on the east. And we're also seeing some ex what appear to be extensional um, systems, uh, corridors of mineralization running north, northwest to south, southeast. So a really exciting place for us to be and uh, real virgin ground. This had never been licensed before. Um, Cameroon is undergoing a, uh, or has undergone a, a big investment from the World Bank to develop the mining sector. They put in place new mining laws. They put in place new new geological data sets, new geochemistry, geophysics. And uh, we picked up this ground and targeted it in 2019 and we've granted the licenses early this year. And uh, we believe there's a, there's a great opportunity here for a new, a new gold district. Uh, in Senegal, we have a, a large license, 472 square kilometers with five prospects on it, uh, the most promising of which to date is the Faray project in the north, 
And here we have over six kilometers of gold extension. Again, this was um, <clears throat> primarily drilled about five or six years ago, prior to Iron Gold coming in, and then Iron Gold have, have followed up with that exploration. And we're getting some really good intersections from the work this year. Uh, you know, long, wide cuts, um, 50, 60, 70 meters wide, a um, couple of grams, and some in the far A, far south target, uh, a new discovery this year, 35 meters at 3.6 grams, including 18 meters at 6.4. So certainly um, decent widths that, that indicate to us the opportunity for um, for a new, uh, new mine target in this Greenfields area. And that's it for me. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Tim. Well, now that the audience is a bit more uh, yeah. oriented and introduced to each of your companies, I think now's a great time to dive into today's real topic in Greenfields. Um, I'd like to go around the horn. Tell us about specifically and tell the audience specifically more about your property, more about your Greenfield uh, and maybe what led you or attracted you to those properties. Uh, Tim, let's bounce it right back to you. Well, the, the key thing for us in, in Cameroon um, was the fact that it was so massively underexplored. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the economics of ore deposits change over time. You could have an area which is previously mined, which gets abandoned for a number of years for whatever reason. Rick had a good example earlier on where the, the previous mining had focused on the very, very high grade narrow veins. And now they're looking at the wider section, slightly lower grade, but in today's climate, certainly economic. Um, in Cameroon, uh, we've had other reasons for, for not investing recently. The government has really, up until sort of five or six years ago, was really not that interested. They were more oil and gas focused. So um, we've really timed it right. We've hit that window of opportunity. And um, <clears throat> to me, it reminds me a lot of, I, I went into Tanzania in the, in the 1990s when Tanzania was opening up. And, you know, in the space of 10 years, you went from having no operating gold mines in Tanzania to having five, um, you know, discovered, developed, uh, constructed and into operation within within that sort of 10 year block. And we believe Ca Cameroon has that opportunity. It's, it's a mobile belt zone between two cratons so deep structures reactivated with fluids, you know, mineral rich fluids coming up. Um, <clears throat> compression and extension, the right type of host rocks, the right age of rocks. The right type of alteration so geologically the whole package is just there and um you know what's been holding it back perhaps has been the um the the politics and the um sort of interest in typical mid-tier and major companies going into more shall we say more mature jurisdictions um in west africa uh you know ghana senegal mali burkina faso and uh, what we're seeing now is is cameroon is playing catch-up um, which is great opportunity for us. And that, that's where we see the opportunity to get in and to, to be first movers. Uh, you know, we've been there for over three years now. We've built good relationships. We've picked some fantastic ground, open ground, um, so we can operate quickly, cheaply, importantly, very cheaply and uh, very efficiently to progress um, the, these early stage greenfields areas into uh, target development and, and hopefully uh, new discoveries. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Tim. Um, Mark, what about you? What about Gigamels? Well, you know, one of the reasons um, that I got interested in Brazil is that, you know, our core project um, is more at the development stage than the exploration stage. Um, and I've been involved with that since 2004. It's been something of a labor of love. Um, and, uh, you know, so so what that is, it's an extremely large um, deposit uh, with economics that are marginal at the low end of the commodity price range. Um, it's now coming into its own because of the electric vehicle revolution. Uh, you know, nickel, nickel has caught a bid. And so the leverage in a deposit like this is uh, quite incredible. And it's gotten interesting for that reason. But there have been times when things have been quite slow, when the nickel price is quite low. And I just got interested, uh, you know, personally in, in 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 this whole idea of well, if there's an extension of the of the West African uh, copper belt in Brazil, well, wouldn't it be interesting if you could find anything like what you see in the Congo? I mean, these deposits are phenomenal that the, that they've got in the Congo, and and you know, just just as a you know, just as an aside to the copper production. Um, you know, Congo provides 70% of the world's cobalt. And, uh, you know, it's just, 
it's it's just an amazing uh, belt of mineralization. And, you know, uh, it's just, if you could find something, anything like that in Brazil rather than in the Congo, Brazil is not an easy jurisdiction, but it's, uh, but it's workable. And it's certainly much, much uh, better jurisdiction than the Congo. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's just, it's just, I find it interesting. Uh, we're able to operate relatively uh, cheaply in Brazil. We're, we're spending about $300,000 on this uh, 10 hole uh, program with a, you know, with a percussion drill, um, you know, drilling to about 150 meters because we want these uh, deposits to be close to surface. And we think they are. So, you know, that was it. It, it, uh, it. You know, it started off as something that we were pursuing because it was slow times at the nickel. Um, but that has changed in the last few years. We're now quite busy with Turnigan, but we're continuing this uh, this uh, Brazilian exploration program because it looks promising. So, no, absolutely, uh, Brandon. Maybe you could talk about uh, fireweed zinc. Yeah, you know what attracted us, uh, attracted us to the project was that um, exploration is hard, and there had been a tremendous amount of work done on the project, and that work was sort of half finished, so to speak. So what we saw was a project where. Um, we were able to build on uh, a lot of sunk costs of our predecessors, right? So when you're able to come in and, and, and buy a project for roughly 5 million that's had 100 million spent on it, you've got a lot of data to work with. And so, you know, we, we took a look at it and we, and we said, like, look, the, this hasn't been properly delineated. Um, the district has potential. The, the change in, in thinking around how these deposits are formed also highlighted a lot of potential which which is now manifested right so um but it all kind of started with like look this this is a the Selwyn basin is prolific for these styles of deposits um there's two really great ones there already we think those have potential we think the district has potential so it, it made sense to, to take a shot at it and, and you know so far we've been right oh fair enough and rick uh, what about you yeah, so Contango got involved with uh, the Tetlin tribe uh, uh, in, uh, 10 years ago, and uh, the tribe had never opened their land up to exploration. So not even to the USGS, the United States Geological Survey, or to the state survey, state of Alaska survey. So this truly was a totally green fields area. They, they had set aside uh, a reserve for the, for the Tetlin tribe. Uh, to keep basically to keep all the white prospectors out. This was at the of course the turn of the century, and then with the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act passed in 1971, the tribe said, "Well, we just want our land. Just give us our land, and, and uh, we'll be happy with that." So, the tribe owns it's the largest block of of uh, private land in the country, owned by one group. Uh, it's 700 uh, or sorry, um, yeah, 788,000 acres. So it's the size of Rhode Island, a small state. <laughs> In the United States, and again, no one had ever really stepped foot on this land geologically. And uh, uh, the way the Mancho project was discovered, basically, it is one of the closest areas to the to the highways, the, the uh, Alaska Highway. And so they set up their camp close by and and started grassroots exploration, stream sediment sampling, and concentrate sampling, you know, old time prospecting boots, and then get boots on the ground. Next year, you have some anomalies, you follow them up, you go upstream and lo and behold, you find some gossiness material, get the assays back at the end of the summer and oh geez, it ran nine grams. Come back the next year and you know do some trenching, do some hand trenching, get some equipment in there, start to drill and you, you, know, you can quickly find uh, a, a, a deposit. And this, this happens to be a very high quality deposit, four grams open pit right at Right at the surface. So, and that's, I think that's the magic of Greenfield's exploration, uh, particularly when, you know, nobody else has been out there. It's that excitement of discovery and, uh, and you can go from, you know, zero to 60 in a few minutes. So um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a also just a hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> it sounds fun. And as you say, right, you know, zero to 60, Mark, you mentioned it can be like lightning. Um, and I guess that sort of, leads into the next question, but are Greenfield mines better 
then exploring a historic mine. I'd love to pose that and hear from the entire group. Uh, whoever would like to hop on that one. Well, I think, um, you know, doing brownfields exploration is probably more lucrative or less risky. But, you know, as Rick was saying, it's fun doing greenfields exploration because, you know, it's intellectually stimulating. You know, it's a lot of plotting work. Um, but, you know, you don't get hit by lightning unless you've got a drill turn. And so, you know, it's very methodical. You, you, know, you, you, you take all these steps towards defining a drill target. Um, but, my God, I guess part of it is that all of us that are in this business have a bit of gamble in our blood. And so it's that, you know, rolling the dice and hoping to find something uh, that's really the fun part of this business to me. I think Mark also, isn't it also tying together, um, you know, that opportunity it, it, Brownfields, as you say, is, is quite sort of uh, de-risked to a point. Um, but Greenfields exploration really, you get the chance to test uh, your hypotheses. You get the chance to test your theories. Um, I, I happen to have worked with both uh, Mr. Tucker and Mr. Hill in, in uh, Africa previously. Um, I, I've been knocking around there for about 30 years. So I, I've worked with them both. And, you know, the excitement of identifying a new area that you are convinced has opportunity um, and then being able to go out and, and having to prove it to yourself and to your investors is, is really quite, it is quite a special feeling. Um, and I think the, the, the other thing about greenfields is it gives you the chance to, if you're going into a brand new area, virgin territory, it gives you the chance to do it right from the beginning. Um, I think we've all been exposed and we've all worked in areas where brownfields, there's legacy stuff out there before you and kind of, Half of the work you're doing is is to trying to um, tiptoe through um, previous work programs that perhaps were done a little bit uh, differently to, to how you would have done them. Whereas if it's if it's a completely new target area, completely new district, then you get the opportunity to put in place your plan as as you and your team um, think is the the best and ultimately the most sustainable way to do it. So so I think it's uh, it's great. Also, of course, there are fewer and fewer really untramped areas of ground left. Um, you have to have a reason. You know, Cameroon, it was the politics a little bit. Rick, with your explanation of the, the land ownership, again, there's a reason why nobody's done it before. Um, so it's a bit of that explorer's spirit, isn't it, to sort of try and get around that and get in on the ground and, and have a look for yourself. Yeah, when it's truly new territory, you can you can literally stumble across an outcrop that, you know, is mineralized and, and meaningful. And, and um, in brown fields, the low hanging fruit's gone, right? So that's not to say that if you find something, it's, it's going to be easier to develop for sure. But um, it's the finding something, you know, like you're looking for the, the little slivers that were faulted off or something, you know, you're the odds that you're finding another giant in a big brown very brownfields location is, is just reduced right so um you know that's that's the appeal of greenfields is like the 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 you know the jewel of the crown is is maybe still there right i mean well, well yeah, you know so yeah i mean we we one of the things we did when we were looking at cameroon uh was we did a <clears throat> a very very simplistic um distribution curve of uh, orogenic gold deposits in geographical terrains and looked at the typical spread of, you know, smaller 100,000 ounce, 500,000 ounce, million ounce, 10 million, 15 million ounce deposits. And um, if you look at the, the typical areas in, you know, the sort of Senegal, Mali window, um, you know, you get a you get a distribution curve and you can plot on the distribution curve, the smaller deposits, the mid tier you know, and then the occasional real outlier, outliers of, of super giant deposits. Um, and we did this for a number of different uh, terrains for orogenic gold around around Africa. And we did it for Cameroon. And Cameroon, the graph was completely empty <laughs> because nobody's found anything yet. I mean, there's some gold mining going on, but it's alluvial mining um, dredging in the rivers. So it's that opportunity to trip over that outcrop, as you say, Brandon, to, to literally come across something nobody's ever ever really put into context before is um, is the exciting thing. 
And there's all, as uh, I think Tim uh, had mentioned, there's there's all sorts of reasons why uh, at a particular moment in time, nobody's doing any exploration on, it, on an area. And then in the case of uh, our Lucky Shot project, uh, it was a very active district from the 19 teens up until 1942 when the, the War Act uh, shut down all non-essential mining in the United States and gold mining was considered non-essential. Copper and tungsten was was essential mining, iron ore was essential mining, but gold, um, it wasn't. And so all these mines just, boom, one day were open, next day were shut down. Uh, they're all owned by small families uh, and, uh, you know, uh, time goes on. Uh, the first exploration work that was done in here after the shutdown was in nineteen in the nineteen eighties, and uh, and then only sort of sporadically, you know, here and there, a few companies uh, drilled some holes, um, and so you've got kind of a, in in, the, in our situation at Lucky Shot, you've got kind of a combination of having a lot of data. It's all old historic data, underground mine plans, etc. But you know, you say that this you know, this five foot zone has, you know, an ounce and a half per ton that that kind of gets your attention. And, um, and then you've got new modern techniques, uh, airborne surveys, uh, uh, that you can apply. And, uh, uh, it's, yeah, again, you can go from zero to 60 very quickly. So, um, it's, that's what's, and that's the most exciting thing about greenfield exploration. I think you have to also consider that, you know, the, the part of the appeal of brownfields was like, okay, it's already disturbed. Right. So so there's already a mess there. So nobody should mind if I make more of a mess. Um, but there's a lot of changing, certainly in Canada, that there's a lot of change around on, on that sort of thinking and, and particularly around what, you know, what they call cumulative impacts. Right. So being next to a mine in, in certain parts of Canada now may make it difficult to make a mine because they're going to they're going to say that this area has already had quite a bit of impact. And the cumulative impacts of another mine um, is too much, right? So um, the the blessing of brownfields may not like may not be what it once was, right? Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes being the only project in an area can actually work in your favor. Yeah. On the, on the other hand, not to not to be a Debbie Downer, but on the other hand, you don't have the infrastructure that you know that that being next to a modern mine has and so that what that does really is it, it, it ups the, the scale of what you've got to be looking for usually in terms of both size and quality you know size to sort of be able to afford to get a 20-year mine life in front of you and be able to plan on infrastructure and then quality because you know quality is always better than not <laughs> high grade is always better than low grade but um but that i think it's an important thing you know i've always been a proponent of uh you only find what you're looking for. So if you if you're looking for low grade, you're going to find low grade. If you're looking for high grade, you're going to find high grade. And um, and that that's you have to plan your exploration out around that thesis. So if you you don't have infrastructure, you've got to find a, a large high grade deposit. Uh, we did that at Donlan, um, and uh, you know it's one of the best largest under undeveloped gold deposits in the world. It does take time to build that infrastructure and get the thing permitted and all those things. But, um, but you, you got to set your sights on, on the right target. I think that's an important thing for greenfield exploration. Yeah, completely agree. You know, and I also think part of the fun is, uh, you know, putting together a team of geoscientists and, you know, having them all work together from geophysicists to, to, to geologists, to, you know, in many cases, you know, uh, you know, you want to learn something fairly early about the metallurgy of what you're finding. And, you know, as a non-technical person, as a non-geoscientist, I just, I just like putting teams together and, you know, letting them run. And, and uh, it's fun, um, you know, the sort of, you know, when the ideas start floating around and, you know, somebody figures out something new and, you know, other members of the team jump on that. It's it's really really thrilling. I find so. Yeah, brownfield sites tend to come with a lot of dogma about what works and and what you should be looking for and how you should be looking for it. Right. So, uh, you know, greenfield sites does give your 
geologists and and you know broader geoscientists a chance to kind of think outside the box a little bit right because it's it's not well understood right so any anything's possible yeah you've got yeah, one of the things i always like to look for when i go into a new project area is uh, things called boundary fault um uh, <laughs> th those things always get my attention because you know somebody's made a they drilled a couple of holes over there and they didn't find what they were looking for and and so they you know it kind of gets written off and uh I love those kind of situations because uh, you just, you know, maybe look at the geology a little differently, interpret it a bit differently, and you come up with a different interpretation that says, okay, well, I got to drill one more hole over here to test that theory. Yep. Yeah, we literally have, we're exploring the boundary zone, which is a boundary of nothing, right? Like there's not, it's not, it's not bounding anything. It's in the middle of the project, right? So. <laughs> so I'm wondering about, um, the processes to getting mine permitting and maiden properties. Um, are these processes a bit more stringent because there is no history to these properties? Um, what are some challenges that you're faced with when you're dealing with the greenfield? Well, I think it really depends on, on where you are, which kind of jurisdiction you're in. You know, as Brandon has already mentioned about this cumulative impact thing in, um, in some parts of the world, um, that is, is a much more uh, important driver behind permitting i mean in, in cameroon at the moment cameroon's biggest issue is to try and try and attract investment in exploration and mining because they're primarily have been um focused on that the gdp has come from oil and gas and uh, timber and tourism so so mining is a is a, a a real good step for them as a primary industry so so the potentially um we have a different set of challenges is uh, you know if we find something that's of interest uh, we might be going through early stage permitting with with um, a ministry that's perhaps not as used to doing it as in some more developed countries uh, where the, the mining industry is more developed rather. Um, but as Brandon says, you, you, Brandon says you've got the flip side. You know, maybe it's too developed, and maybe they're holding back. Um, I, I think it's uh, it's very difficult to <clears throat> to sort of pick the the ideal time and and the the permitting and the, the focus on different areas of it will change over time as well. Um, you know, obviously with the, with, we've just had COP26 here in the UK and the focus on um, mining companies getting involved in, in reducing carbon footprints and um, the sort of climate change stuff is, is going to be part and parcel of the, the focus of permitting in the future. Um, so we're, we're all, we're, I think one of the great things about the extractives industries in general is we're all very good at adapting. And I think that's one thing that perhaps um, we as an industry, we don't necessarily get credit for very often, but we are very good at adapting to the situation. And I think that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're in a place that doesn't see much, if any, mining, um, maybe they don't have a negative perception of it. They may also not have a positive perception of it, right? So... Um, when you've got an established mining industry somewhere and you've got families that are mining families, et cetera, they want to see more of this, right? So yeah. someone's in a greenfields location, it's kind of like a shrug, like maybe we don't need these jobs or, or, you know, that sort of thing. So you are dealing with, um, for better, for worse, a bit more ambivalence perhaps about the projects. Yeah, well, look at um, there is a, a large company with a large lithium project in Serbia at the moment where part of the population, which is used to mining, are really pro getting the project up and running. And part of the population feel they're not going to benefit from it. So they're against it. And, um, you know, it's it's a, a really good example of that, of, of getting that sort of split. Um, and, and, you know, these days, mining companies all have um, a, a requirement to develop sustainably. And uh, to be quite frank, you you just will not be able to develop a mine unless you develop it properly. So um, it, it's more, I, I think, as an industry, we've got to just be better at uh, how we educate the people we're working in whose communities we're working. You know, I just think Tim's, Tim's raising a very interesting point there about, you know, acquiring what they call social license. And in fact, I know that uh, Rick was a pioneer of that uh, in the deal he cut with the tall town. Um, God, how long ago was that? 15 years ago, 20 years ago, but that was, uh, that was kind of a pioneering deal. And, uh, I can report because, you know, I deal with the tall town that they are, are very mining friendly. And I give some of the credit for that to Rick. Um, they've just learned that you can make a lot of money in the mining business. And, um, 
you know, and that they're high paid jobs and, you know, and a lot of the elders want these high paid jobs uh, in their territories so that the population doesn't continue to shrink. Hmm. So, you know, and these are jobs where you can go to Hawaii for a vacation. I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, they're, they're doing very well, the tall 10. They're, they're, they're actually doing extremely well out of the mining business. Um, and, you know, I, and so I think you, you have to be looking for that social license wherever you go. You're not going to tend to spend money in Greenfields exploration if you're in a jurisdiction where it's almost impossible to permit a mine. Mm-hmm. I don't think I would spend money in Michigan, for example. You know, the U.S. is state by state. Um, you, know, you know, Alaska, you can certainly, uh, you know, get a mine permitted. It's not without challenges, but it can be done. Um, but, you know, I think you, you make it easier ultimately to permit if you have the support of the locals. And, uh, you know, I think that's, that's a very important part of this whole discussion. And, and that is, that comes basically from opportunity. I mean, most people, you know, I ran a project in Pakistan and, um, the local tribes, the local communities, The only thing they wanted was a fair crack at the whip. They wanted an opportunity, just like everybody else, for their people to get the jobs that were that were coming up. Um, And so sometimes you have to help level the playing field by providing a bit of training and bringing their capacity up to to meet uh, your level that you need in the mind. But, you know, the extractives industry in general, apart from a few specialized roles, um, these are very cross-transferable skills. Drivers, mechanics, fitters, boilermakers, carpenters, electricians. You know, a lot of the mining skill set is, is day-to-day jobs that you can then 10 years later take off into construction or, or civil engineering or other, other fields. Um, and the communities, certainly communities I've worked with in, in Africa and, and Asia, um, they just want the opportunity to, to be able to get those jobs alongside everybody else. And... Um, you know, we we are an unusual industry in that we can't relocate. The deposit is where the deposit is, um, and uh, you know we can't we can't move it, <laughs> not until it's been mined. That's why you know setting up uh, working with groups like the Taltan and in uh, supporting them and setting up a, a trust, mm-hmm. which they uh, they did. You know, now fifteen it was in two thousand six, I think it is. So I don't even want to. It's more than fifteen years, but. Uh, they they use that that vehicle then to uh, I think they've got a war chest of say eighty million dollars now, um, and they don't use the principal. They invest the principal, and then they they use the uh, the interest um, to, to to fund programs, to fund training, and 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 you know, get in the business uh, of mining. And that's why the Tall Tan are so supportive of mining because they are in the business of mining. Um, and they they've been very proactive and and uh, and um, it's it's been it's a good model it's a really good model we've worked the same way with the the Tetlin tribe uh, they're going to make a lot of money with the royalty with their underlying royalty from uh, the Mancho deposit and uh, use that money for for building a community base and, and, and reinvesting back into the community and that's that's what really sustainability is fundamentally all about so uh, it's it's a good model. I think that's, sorry, Brendan, that's one of the green, one of the things with greenfields is you're able to make a huge difference to those people, um, a much bigger impact, a much bigger positive impact in a greenfields area where there's there's nothing um, than you would be, you know, in downtown Detroit or something. You know, your your impact on the local community is so much bigger uh, in a greenfields area. Just to say, one of the things that, that Mark hit on is, uh, I think it was Mark talking about, you know, you need to be somewhere where you can permit it, right? And and um, I think that's, if if there's a weak point of Greenfield's exploration, is a, a lot of it tends to be uh, geologist driven and and the engineering is a, is a very late afterthought, um, you know, engineering and permitting and social license, et cetera, right? And, and so I think injecting some pragmatism into the early greenfield exploration is is critical because you know you don't until you delineate your deposit you don't know what it looks like and you don't know what the mine's going to look like but you should have some concept right like of like this is what i'm looking for and this is what the mine's probably going to look like 
is that feasible here and is it allowable <laughs> right because if it's if it one of those two isn't there then then uh it doesn't matter how sexy the geology is right so um that's a, a critical thing is when you're looking at your potential search spaces because there's all sorts of wonderful places that you can find great deposits but they're not going to make great mines right so that's that's the critical difference is is understanding your challenges and making sure that it's not just a great deposit it can be a great mine yeah, exactly yeah and that that's why the the experience base of your team has to be broad um <clears throat> it's it's great to have some some really active boots on the ground exploration geologists out there, but you need to have that broader experience base within your management team to understand that and to be able to manage that and put in place just some really basic first steps, you know, to, a, a register for communication with the, the communities, you know, make a list of, of who you speak to when and what you talk about and make sure you're not planting seeds and perceptions that are just wholly unrealistic that are going to come back to haunt the project in the future and that sort of thing. Well, I think there's a great opportunity uh, for the for the mining industry uh, as we shift to uh, a non-carbon future, both in terms of energy production and transportation, the amount of metal necessary to do make that transition. I don't think people really have gotten their heads around. And so um, when you sort of look out over the next, you know, not just 10 years, 20, 30 years, you know, a, a, a plan to, to decarbonize uh, energy and transportation by 2050 might start to look somewhat realistic. But the amount of metal that it takes to do that, I don't think anybody's really gotten their head around. And then, you know, in Alaska here, we're seeing, a. Uh, I think somebody else mentioned the shift in Cameroon. Uh, Tim, you mentioned that. Um, we're starting to see that here in Alaska, where people are starting to think about 20 years from now, what's What's the uh, what's the um, amount of money from oil going to be? What's the revenue from oil going to be if in this new future, 20, 30, 40 years from now? Um, and, you know, frankly, there's not a, lot, a whole lot of things you can do in Alaska competitively, um, you know, because it's cold and dark like it is right now, 35 below and dark outside still. So, um, you know, mining is is really that next tier. You can only fish so much. You can only lo log so many trees. And you can only, you know, stuff so many tourists on a boat uh, in a, in a three month window of summer. So um, I think people are starting to understand that mining really is one. One, we need it to to achieve the the, the green energy future. But two, uh, for Alaska, it's it's like the number two industry up here. It's the only one that wasn't shut down during COVID. And I think people are realizing that mining can be done in a sustainable and environmentally sensitive manner. Um, you know the, the the disasters that people point to typically are from you know mining projects that were 50 100 150 years ago and it's legacy stuff that really uh we have the opportunity now to try and clean up and uh, maybe reset uh reset the uh people's focus on mining as a as a a, a good thing rather than just sort of a necessary evil and that's, yeah, that's exactly what we're doing at the you know hill mine in the yukon it's you know it's an old legacy site 100 years of, of mining without regulation um we took that project on in lexco and uh we're cleaning up the legacy work and we're finding new new silver mines to put into production so uh, uh yeah it's we're it's a good sustainable model well, i think you know your point rick about um um you know the, the low carbon future and, and critical metals for that we're not going to brownfields our way there we're not you know that there there's it's simply no conceivable way that we can even tread water on brownfields expansions and exploration let alone you know build the base we need to to supply those critical metals right so um you know you, you kind of deal with the um you know, you're talking about the mines where the metal is right that's where the deposit is you can't you can't move it and you know if it's too close to to uh a town it's it's like you know not in my backyard if you're too far it's pristine wilderness uh, um you know so it, you're you're always dealing with one thing and and um you know you tell you about the the, the environmental disasters that preceded us we kind of end up with the, the kind of mining original sin which is that all of us wear the wear the the sins of the miners before us we yep. go to talk to communities etc right so 
you know, hopefully with a modern era the, of, of better practices and, and um, safer and, and zero or very few, um, you know, contamination, et cetera, issues, um, opinions start to shift, right? And, and there's been massive underinvestment in the sector. So I think that when it comes around, it's, it's going to be fierce. Yeah, I, I uh, <laughs> you know, I really to pick up on what Rick was saying earlier, um, people just have no concept how much metal is going to be needed uh, for the electric vehicle revolution and, and, and sort of the electrification of everything. Uh, copper, of course, nickel, etc. cetera. Um, so if you want to be green, you need the metal. Uh, people are interested in sustainable um, production of metal. Just, just one interesting little sidelight is that uh, at our Turnigan deposit, we've been doing a lot of research into um, sequestering CO2 in our silicate tailings. You expose silicate minerals to the atmosphere, they will absorb CO2 and convert to carbonate minerals. And the CO2 is gone basically forever. Um, we've been working with uh, um, uh, UBC on this um, uh, you know, quite extensively, and it's meaningful. Um, it, it's, it's when you grind, uh, silicates up to, you know, sort of 80 to hundred microns, which works, which is what we're planning to do. And you spread it out in beaches and expose it to the atmosphere. It's, uh, it's a meaningful amount of CO2 that gets sequestered. And so this is the sort of thing that, you know, helps to get, uh, the communities on side, the politicians on side, you know, anything you can do to point out that you're doing it more sustainably. Uh, you know, helps with the permitting process. Gentlemen, I think today's conversation has been really, really great. Um, you know, I think we might have to do a, a second episode, so to speak, in the future. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have all the time in the world today. Um, so before we wrap up today, I'd like to ask one final question that we've ha received that it can be posed to the entire group. But to everyone else that's asked questions, especially, especially questions uh, to specific speakers today, We'll be passing on those questions and make sure that you have the opportunity to receive an answer. So I apologize for the, the time uh, issue here today, but um, uh, maybe we'll start with Rick uh, and we'll go around the horn before we wrap up again. How do you see the progress in your exploration route from the day you began operations to today? Well, again, I think we're in a bit of a somewhat unique situation that we're, we have an advanced stage project that'll be in production in two years and we have the capital uh, available to us to, to meet to meet that. So, uh, and we don't have a lot of shares outstanding. So we're, you know, we're highly leveraged to uh, any increases in prices or increasing uh, increases in, in the, in the uh, margin. And with a, you know, roughly a thousand dollar margin and producing 60, uh, 60,000 ounces, uh, 60, 70,000 ounces a goal a year, that's 60, 70 million dollars of, of free cash flow. So we can, we can really sort of lay out a long-term plan of, of exploring our other lands and find to find new new big deposits and uh, uh, our high quality deposits. Um, my mantra is to work close to uh, closer to uh, infrastructure these days. Um, I spend a lot of time in Alaska in, in remote areas, but uh, I'm going to you know, try to not get too far away from the highways and uh, so that you can see our, our land packages are, are you know, right in and around the highway network. So that's our uh, that's our plan for the next few years here. Absolutely. Brandon, what about Fireweed Zinc? Yeah, you know, we we um, we bought the project. There were two deposits on it. And we expanded the the land package and, and we made some additional discoveries there. And it was kind of a um, it's a bit of a Hollywood problem to make discoveries and have to go back in in the progress. You know, we we uh, could have had a PFS and perhaps been starting permit permitting on just the Tom and Jason deposits, but, you know, we made that choice to reevaluate the district and, and do some exploration. And I, and I think, you know, that's paid significant dividends in terms of what we discovered and the project looks a lot different and, and we're happy to now, you know, be making that transition into engineering and permitting on the right project. Right. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the near future of, of fireweed is, taking the results of this exploration um, and then these significant new deposits we've found and, and reframing the opportunity there and then, and then putting the big boy pants on and, and getting stuck into it. Absolutely. Mark, what about Giga Metals? 
Well, uh, our project in Brazil really started as a research project. And in fact, we uh, hired an artificial intelligence firm called Minerva Intelligence uh, to go through the reams and reams and reams of data uh, in the San Francisco craton uh, of, of Brazil. I mean, there's academic papers, there's, there's regional geochem surveys, there's geophysics, etc. And so it really started as chewing through a lot of published data um, to, to, to kind of narrow in on areas of interest. And so we've taken it from a research project to we've actually got boots on the ground there now. And, uh, um, you know, we're already, uh, you know, drilling, uh, you know, very inexpensively with a percussion rig, but it's just an initial kind of survey. Um, these kind of deposits don't lend themselves very well to exploration via geophysics. Um, and so you need physical exploration. So it's, you know, it's exciting. It's still very grassroots, um, but you can really see the progress from sort of an idea to boots on the ground to who knows what happens next. We'll see. Thank you, Mark. And Tim, last but not least. Well, Cameroon, um, you know, we, we <clears throat> have a, a great belief that Cameroon is going to open up as new mining jurisdiction for multiple commodities, uh, not just gold. Uh, but certainly on the gold space, we've, you know, we've been able to, um, over the last three years, we've been able to pick up a, a sizable piece of what we believe is the best, most prospective ground in central Cameroon for orogenic gold. We've proven orogenic gold a long trend, along that structural trend to the north up at Bibimi and Wapuzi, uh, and uh, done some sort of prospect drilling up there and, uh, and currently with some follow-up drilling. So, um, you know, our our techniques, we're, we're an AIM-listed junior company, a London-listed junior company. Um, so for us, it's about getting the best bang for your buck. And that is boots on the ground, early stage, soil sampling, stream sediment sampling, mapping, a um, little bit of trenching, then ultimately drill testing. That to us um, is, is a great way to progress uh, the, the land holdings we have. And uh, we're, we're pretty confident that um, certainly based on the first six months work we've done, the central license package will, uh, will deliver and, uh, you know, fast forward a couple of years and we could be looking at a, a real mining boom in Cameroon and, and we would be very happy to be uh, one of the first companies leading that. Great. Thank you, Tim. Gentlemen, thank you for the great presentations and the great conversation today. I'd like to also, of course, thank everyone in the audience for joining us. Uh, and with that, I hope everyone has a good rest of their day. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you.